KD's in the place. Dave's hair is in the place. Hey. You're in the place. I resemble that remark. It's Pensado's place. Hey. Yay! Yay! Man, I had something in my throat. I got caught off guard with no, my you, yay. You missed rehearsal. We had yay rehearsal I, yesterday. I know. And you didn't come to yay rehearsal. That's not good. Man. Coca-Cola sponsors the yay. You think they'll be okay? No. <clears throat> we'll recut it and put it back in the show. Good. Shoot. <laughs> Saved. Man. <clears throat> I can barely talk. Hey, guys. How you doing? Glad to have you back. Uh, it just seems like we were just here an hour ago. It was last week. It's Time cool. flies. We're yeah. having fun. When you guys when you guys make it fun, it's really really fun, and we appreciate all the support you're giving us. And uh, uh, I have nothing exciting to tell you this week, other than uh, our guest this week is one of my favorites. We're going to get to that in a minute. Herb's got some homework to take care of. Um, it's all the normal stuff that you already know. So um, uh, our homework stuff: Facebook, Twitter. Pens um, you know to go to the. Pensado's Place, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, and you see it up on the screen as usual. Um, we always want to thank our partners, Vintage King. Let's say hello to Vintage King. Yay. Hey, VK, that was a pretty good That was game. a good one. It's a better one. Yeah. A little bit more audio. Out. Right, makes the I know, audio I know what this does now. I know how to start see? simulating that stuff. Prep, prep. <laughs> so hello to Vintage King, and uh, <clears throat> our man in the house is Darren Finley. Darren, what's going Darren, on? Darren, what's up? And as usual, our friend Dave, there's Darren, Darren's screen is oh, up. Cool. And as usual, our friend Dave has a stump the Vintage King rep question, which well, would be? Well, KD and I were wondering, like we hear talk about these power cables that are like hundreds and hundreds of dollars and they can actually improve the quality of your sound. Is that true? And if it's not true, what about like, there's guys that spend a trillion dollars on wire for studios. Can you really hear a difference between different types of wire? I mean, once you get past a certain quality level, is there a difference between a $20 mic cable and a $300 mic cable? All right, so folks in the chat room get busy. Good, admit that, Herb, that was a good one. That was a good one. As a matter of fact, Drew Adams is, a, is in our corner office. There's what Drew. the deal? So, Drew, you'll be monitoring to see if Drew, the other Drew, gets I'll see, stumped. yeah. I'll see what his response Keep is. Keep us informed, Drew. Uh, all right. Matter of fact, if he has a, tell us what he might have quit. <laughs> <laughs> he might have quit. <laughs> um, and uh, as usual, listen, thanks for all the inquiries that come to our website. That's PensadosPlace.tv. Go there for information. And uh, as we've been promising, we are going to aggressively be updating what's going on there. There you see a screenshot of it. And uh, everything from inquiries about Dave, what's going on with the show, episodes of the show. Uh, more, soon, a lot more to come in that space. Um, I can't wait. I think that's most of the stuff. Uh, a quick shout out to Leo Saramanga, who has had. Leo. Leo, that's all right. Leo, uh, like Leo, one of our avid guys, not one of our avid followers, not an avid person, but not the anyways. Um, but we had a really interesting exchange about. Um, following your ideas, putting forth new ideas, and so on and so forth. So um, he's a really bright guy. We had, we had a really good exchange. So I want to say hello to him. Anything from you, sir? Well, I mean, I, why didn't he talk to me about this? I'm a bright guy. Leo's a little brighter. Oh. Is he as bright as Bill Kamek? Huh? Is he as bright as Bill Kamek? Well, you know, we're going to have a Pensado student off <laughs> somewhere in the future. An octagon match. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just a cage we gotta, match. We ought to do, like, do like one of those cooking shows where like, like instead of a basket, like with, with pears and dead fish, you got to figure out how to cook it. Let's, mm. let's like throw in a, a badly recorded kick drum, a vocal that's got too much sibilance, and let's do like one of those cooking shows and give, give the basket to... Well, there, w stop, I when I do that, Herb, you're supposed to stop me when I start dying. I, I, it's more funny to watch you <laughs> die. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but actually, I have people out looking for the Drew, house. you love me. Why come you didn't stop me? That was horrible. I'm not even listening. If we, if we actually have somebody <laughs> in our audience that's watched one of those cooking shows, they shouldn't. So I don't even want to watch them. I have to watch them because my wife watches them. Let's my, get... My, uh, my baby mama. There you go. All right. Well, uh, so anyways, um, we got a great guest. Excellent guest. Illustrious and guest. Friend. And let's get to it. Well, Kevin Davis is our guest. Uh, we all know him as KD. Hopefully you do too. He's one of the top, top guys. KD and I have been friends now for like 20 years. Um, and I've admired his work. I've ripped it off. I've, he's got a snare sample from a song called Your Love is the Shh that I've probably put on about 20 records that were hits. Thanks, KD. And uh, just a great cat and somebody we're going to learn a lot from. So welcome, KD. Good to see you. Hey, 
you. Welcome aboard, man. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Strap thank you. in. <laughs> Good. Uh, Dave, if, he, if he's such a great friend, how come he been, hadn't been on the show sooner? Because he was in Atlanta. And uh, you can't Skype to Atlanta. They don't have internet down there. <laughs> they just got it, though, didn't they, KD? Like, like a year ago. <laughs> but KD, KD's here now, and uh, he's, he's living in L.A., which is where he's from. Your parents were essentially both musicians, weren't they? Your dad yeah. produced uh, Sly and the Stone, I right? Your mom sang with, uh, yep. Smokey Robinson. with Smokey Robinson. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You should have been good, man. You, hey. If you'd have been bad, that would have been a miracle. Yeah. I mean, I was plus around it since I was a little kid, so basically born into this business. So. I mean, you were all, you were hanging out on the stage with Smokey and stuff, right? You saw yeah, live shows. A lot, a lot of shows. Actually, it was a roadie for him when I was like 14. Is I was there a show? For a few years, yeah, mm. before I started doing this. And so you kind of grew up in studios with your dad, who was since a producer. Since I was, yeah, three, I was probably in the studio. Mm. Yeah. Sleeping. So in. what took you so long? You only got, you only had your first <laughs> hit at 17. You should have had your first hit at like 13. Uh, no, nah, maybe not that early, but yeah, it took me a minute. First hit's an under understatement because he had his first one that everybody knew was Gangster's Paradise, which to me still sounds great and fresh. Guys, go to Spotify and check out Gangster's Paradise. It's it's with my buddy LV and Coolio. Man, what a great mix. Thank you, thank you. There's only one version of that mix, right? Yeah, I mean. Because there's a few people taking credit. They're lying, right? Uh, me, Doug Rashid produced it and went straight you to Herb it. and Mastering, and that was it. Our buddy Herb Powers? Yep. Herb's here now, too, isn't he? He's uh, actually in Orlando. I just sent him some oh. stuff uh, last week, actually. Hello, Herb, if you're watching. Um, and then um, the next thing I remember, um, when we met, had you, you hadn't done Gangster's Paradise at that time, right? I don't think so, no. Because you, you were working at Soundcastle. Yeah, no, I left there by then at that point. Did you think I really sucked when you first started working with me? Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not too that bad. That wasn't an unequivocal. <laughs> I was no. a muted. <laughs> I understood. <laughs> well, I, I, we were talking before the show, and I, I know he was better than I was because when I first moved here, I didn't know much, but I learned pretty quick. Uh, and. Um, the next thing I remember was Closer, the the big Neo hit. You yeah. did that with, Stargate did that, right? Stargate did that, right, yeah. So you've been mixing a lot of stuff for them. I did a few They're, things for them, yeah. So and then Rihanna, yeah. T.I., Pink, mm -hmm. Outkast. You won a Grammy for Outkast, won a Grammy for Neo. Mm -hmm. uh, who am I leaving out? Um, Mariah, Chris Brown. Mm -hmm. um, you did that new Josh Groban, too, didn't you? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. I didn't do Josh Groban. I used that twice in a row, yeah. didn't I? Yeah, it's now deleted. Good. Okay. Edit. Hey, man, um, one of the things that that I've always admired about you is is there's an, uh, you, you, you obviously are very creative, but you have an efficiency that I just don't have. And I'm wondering if that's a, when I say efficiency, I mean, I'm like, I go here, I go here, and then, Midnight, I panic and just throw it all together and call it a mix. And then, but you seem to have um, a discipline that aids your creativity. And, and I, I'm guessing that process is the steps you kind of approach and the way you approach the mixing process. Can you kind of spend a few minutes and let's, let's kind of get our audience that's, that's not accustomed to the way a pro works? Because mm -hmm. the way you work really helps amplify your creativity. I mean, you, you work very efficiently towards the goal of making something great, and, and, and uh, at six at night, I'm worn out wanting to change careers. At six at night, you're 80% you're, you're, you're done with your mix. H how do you start? What, what's your process? Like, like, do you start with the vocals sometimes, or the mm -hmm. kicks, or do you start listening to the rough, or a, a cat starting on his own mixes? This is a five-year question. Right. I'm sorry, this is where I usually get this from Herb. He's not paying attention. Um, just take me to that process. That's right. a short answer. Well, for me, um, we kind of talked on this earlier, you know, especially nowadays, the rough mix is kind of really much pretty much the Bible on how the song's got to feel. Mm -hmm. Maybe not it's got, how it's got to sound all the way, but how it's got to feel. So mm -hmm. what I'll do is kind of listen to it as I'm kind of like setting things up, you know, patch, patches and gear and places where I want things to be. Just kind of vibing with it. And then what I'll do is first kind of start with the lead in the background, just kind of put them in place, some slight compression, maybe a little EQ, just something that I'm hearing. 
and then kind of build the track up around it, starting with the drums, just the basic instruments, the drums and the bass, just kind of building it, but always going back to the lead or the, mm -hmm. the background, just kind of tweaking those as I'm going, mm -hmm. and then start putting things around it, and always referencing the rough at the same time, doing all this as I'm doing it. I probably listen, reference the rough maybe 100 times during the time of a mix, because oh, wow. I want to hear what the verse is doing in the A part, how they how they felt that, and how can I make it better, or make it feel more of what they're trying to come across. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, I don't have a rough sometimes, and I just gotta go for what I know. Mm -hmm. But I kind of pretty much like to have that rough because that's pretty much where everybody's fell in love with the record from. So mm -hmm. you kind of gotta build off of that. I, I was gonna ask you, you may have already answered it, can you over listen to a rough? Is there a point where it can oh, great question, right? um, affect you too much, you need to back off? You, and you can, but for me, I like getting it the way I get it because I'm, I'm not in love with the rough. I don't know the song. Uh -huh. Usually I'm not in love with the song yet or I don't have things about it that I know. I'm just learning it really. So I'm just kind of trying to learn it from just first listening to it and then build off it's of that. It's instructional right. manual as you build right. your thing. Exactly. Gotcha. So for a cat that's mixing their own stuff, the, 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 the advice in that little paragraph of exchange you just had is don't go back and listen to it too much, try and mm -hmm. leave yourself a, a room to be creative. Yeah. And um, if you're working on an instrumental, do you still start with the vocal first? <laughs> Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> that was acting. It was. That's that improv class yeah, you paid that was for pretty me good, to Dave. do the other day. That was pretty but good. What happens? Uh, like, like, I'd say uh, most of the time I don't start with the vocal, but I do a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. um, what's your? Why would you start with the vocal first as opposed to say starting with the music first? Because a long time ago when I was young, I used to start with the music first. I used to start with the drums first. I used to do all that, and I'd have the drums banging, then I'd have the bass banging, and everything would be banging. Then it's time to mix that vocal in, and then I'm finding myself fighting everything that I did for the first 10 hours of the mix, trying to slap wow. these vocals together. And yeah. I learned a long time ago that we can make a kick sound sound great, and a snare can be great, but you know we got to sell that record, sell that melody, sell that lyric, mm -hmm. and that's the most important thing on the is the artist. Now some artists you might have to hide in the track, and the track kind of carries them, but mm -hmm. you know for the most part you got to sell the record and make people want to sing along that, to that, it. That's the best explanation of that I've ever heard. Yeah. Um, so. On Gangster's Paradise, did you start with the drums first or the vocal? Back then, I was young. I probably started with the drums first, and it just kind of came sounds together. Great. Yeah. And closer, Chris Brown. I, I would bet you start with the vocals first on that, because that starts out with just an acapella yeah. part, on, right? On Neil's closer, yeah. Uh, I mean, Neil, yeah, yeah. I probably, yeah. I started with the vocals first on that. Yeah. Wow. And and what would happen? Like, let's say, let's say you did you did a mix, and then you started the traditional way. What would sound What would sound different? If you started with something, it would would the mix sound pretty close, or would it be completely different? Um, like, I, uh, like I would probably imagine now it probably sound pretty similar for me. It's mm -hmm. just I have my way about like you know you have your way about driving or whatever the way you yeah. like to get someplace. So that's just kind of the way I like to get someplace, I and it's kind of easy for me. It makes me kind of from my mind, mm -hmm. okay, I got this, and I can build around that as opposed to the other way. Mm -hmm. Is it is it possible that okay so so. Help me out here, like, okay, w you, when you say you start with the vocals, you, you, you don't make an effort to try and get them perfect. You try to get them 80% close. Just, yeah, get, them, get them in the ballpark, kind of just get a good blend, making sure the harmonies are something in the backs, if they have harmonies or something like that, are sitting right versus the rough, listening to that, and then kind of listening to where the lead's at. Uh -huh. And it's kind of just getting it to where, you know, if I need some compression to smooth them out or whatever it may be, just to kind of so they're sitting in a place where I can start building things around it. Guys, that's, that's, he, he very subtly said something incredibly important. Incredibly important. If he, if it needs it, you, you, compression is an automatic thing that you do. It's if it needs it. I mean, that 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 was a very very uh, important thing you said. That 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 I think uh, uh, you and I both get 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 things to mix that are just so over compressed. We ha it takes us like two hours to kind of uncompress it and everything. Um, Okay, so now we've got the vocals kind of, they don't sound like the finished record, but they sound the better than the rough. Right, right. And then, and then what's, what's, what, what's the next thought that comes to your head? Well, depending on the kind of record it is, um, if it's a sample-based record and the sample is pretty predominant, I may start with the kick and then where the sample is, 
and see how they play and play with the feel of that, see how, how, the, how it feels on a versus the rough. I'm always referencing the rough, seeing what it feels like because that's what everybody knows. When you say play with that, what does that mean? Just play with the, with the, the between the balance between the kick and the bass and just the rhythmic part, section of the, of the track mm -hmm. versus the vocals and where that's sitting. Are you listening to the vocals while you're doing yeah, that? Yeah, I'm, doing, I'm doing listening to the vocals, building it around oh, wow. the vocal, and then maybe I I'll take the vocal that. out for a minute and kind of, you know, get into that a little bit, but uh -huh. bringing the vocal back in because I don't want to make it too big and then the vocals are small. So just to kind of building around the vocal for the most part. That's kind of how I start. I got to do that. That's great. And, and okay, so now, so now we've got our, our vocals kind of roughed in. Mm -hmm. We've got our kick and our snare working together. Bass, guitars, whatever is kind of... I mean, kick and bass, I mean. I'm, 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 my right. mind is thinking while I'm talking and I can't multitask, so... <laughs> Lord knows, get get the edit button ready, Will. Who knows what I'm gonna say today? Okay, and 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 at that point in time, how close are the kick and snare, kick and bass, and the vocals to sounding the way they end up on the record? I mean, kind of like we talked earlier. I'm tweaking everything as I'm going along okay, so to the, the last not minute. To get it's not it's perfect, to get it's perfect, just to get, just it, to get it, it in the ballpark and where I want so it to be. So you can see how that. Right. So would you say a, a good metaphor is? is you're dressing up to go somewhere, but you're not putting the clothes on, you're just laying them out on the bed right, right now exactly. to see which ones exactly. you might want. Okay. Yeah. And, then, and then, then let's say we've got, let's say this is um, not a rock song, but, but, a, but a pretty typical mm -hmm. hip hop R&B song. Right. So what do you do now? Now I'm listening for the next thing that's kind of more dominant in the track. If it's like in a frequency range of the vocals and the, or the guitar or something like that, or like mm -hmm. our sample I was saying before, just kind of seeing where they sit, where they can be up front, but not overshadowing the vocal. You know what I'm saying? You. So, because sometimes you have those things are competing in frequency wise, but you still want it to be prevalent. So you want it to kind of, mm -hmm. kind of mix in, maybe EQ and some mm -hmm. stuff around, maybe throwing something around, maybe an effect or something mm -hmm. to kind of make it feel bigger. On, but, on, on that, on that, oh, yeah. that synth track right. you're talking about. Right. But, but have you put effects on the vocals at this point in time? I might have put something slight on it. Um, I might have it dry. It just depends on the song. Okay. And, and um, man, I just lost my whole train of thought. Okay, so now we've got, we've got the vocals. We've got, we start our drums, the, kick and, the bass and kick. Uh, that, that synth part, what's next? Next is uh, just pull, pulling everything else around, like the pads and uh, whatever little other instruments that might be involved, and kind of just listening to my blend uh -huh. of what well, everything up now mm -hmm. versus the rough. Always referencing the rough, at, at like this I said. Point in time, right. Does the rough still sound better, or are you you feeling uh, like you're sounding better but not complete? Well, I'm listening to my blend and listening to where the rough is, and also deciding where I want to take this rough, where I want to make it better but still in, stay in the same neighborhood, and then listening to my blend and saying, okay, this needs to come up here. Maybe this, I could do something better with these strings. Maybe I can, with those vocals, well, I don't really like the choice of reverb they use on, on the vo lead vocal for the rough, but I like a better sound, and so then I may make that decision to change that for some delay throws they might have. I might add those in at that point. Just kind of just listening to my blend and seeing where I can make my blend better, or so when I put on the rough, the rough doesn't sound like a mix anymore to me. I got gotcha. you. And, and um, at what point do you say, okay, I know where I want to go. I've got this thing kind of in the ballpark of where I want to go. Let me take this thing home. Like, like at what point do you do most of the EQing? Um, I'm EQing as I'm going. Like, like I'm kind of like, I'm okay. always EQing. I'm okay. always doing something and as then, I'm going. And then at what point do you say, okay, this sounds pretty good. I got this kind of... Mm. Like like in the old days, this is the point where we'd turn the automation on. Right. What right. point? Uh, and, 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 and at what point do you think metaphorically about turning well, the automation good, on? Good blend. I fire up the automation, like you said, and uh, I kind of just write some passes down. Um, and I may do some rides here on the on the verses and just mm -hmm. feel out the record, see where things need to go vocally. Um, like I said, some throws, delay throws if it needs to be there. Mm -hmm. Just kind of just feeling the record. Referencing the rough, coming mm -hmm. back to my mix, just kind of getting it to where I want it to be. Cool. And 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 like say, if you start the mix at at noon, at what point? At what point are you at 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 two o'clock? Depends on the song, but um, 
but it always depends on the song. But at two, I'm probably kind of okay. Now I can start driving. Now I can start going. Like, I can start like you said, put on these clothes and kind of put them up. Make sure the t- collar's right. Make sure the tires right. You okay. know what I'm saying? Just kind of dialing it in. And I might dial it in for maybe the next six, seven hours, but mm-hmm. taking breaks a lot. You know, listening mm-hmm. to other stuff. Mm-hmm. Watching some TV a little bit, just kind of get my mind off of it because you That's can listen. so important. Yeah, People have so no important. idea how important right. that definitely, is. Definitely, definitely got to get away from it. And sometimes. then, and then say that by eight o'clock, where are you? I'm pretty close. I'm pretty eight close eight to where. Okay, maybe I can have somebody come listen to it. And we're talking typical. We're right. not talking every right. song. Some songs take two days, right. obviously, and some take less. Right. And and so, at, at the end of the night, say your night ends at two a.m., you're, you're feeling pretty confident, right? I mean, you're, you're done. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever come back the next day and hear improvements, or, or are you pretty I much mean, there? I think it's a mixture of you always hear something that you want to change. Uh, you always hear something that you want to improve. Um, what I'll do is at that point, when I feel really confident, I'll start stemming things out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll stem, you stem every track? I stem every track, and uh, you know, I have make, I'll make a, st- a stem session in Pro Tools. And then uh, I'll... Let me stop, because a couple okay. of guys don't know what stems are. Um, in the old days, stems just meant you printed a TV track, an instrumental, and an acapella. And a TV track is, you can take this track, go to any any place, and have a vocal and a mic, and you can do the song. But you're talking about you actually print every individual track. You try to end up with what 50, 60 tracks? Uh, maybe not that much, but I have had some stem sessions that are pretty much are pretty big like that. Because um, I still mix on a console, I'll print every track if it's two kicks maybe two kicks snare whatever's on the on the console i'm playing every track back in pro tools and then on the vocals i'll do a a, a dry vocal i'll do an affected vocal uh, uh, on all effects no no lead no direct signal yeah and uh i'll just have all those stems in a step in a session and then i'll make a, a copy of my mix from that stem session and just mm-hmm. kind of ride around the car or Put it in, you know, what I'm saying, an iPod, iPad, or whatever, and, and listen that's, to it. That's on different pretty things. cool. I, I got to get more in the habit of riding around in the car with my mix. I'm sorry. Her. No, no, because part of the art at some point in time is knowing when to stop. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? In that part of uh, <laughs> Dave and I are laughing because we have our own conversation about I could start that. a mix today, and, and I I could die doing the same mix. Real happy. Mm-hmm. I could mm-hmm. do a mix forever. Mm-hmm. But right. but you have to know mm-hmm. when you. Because, you know, people who keep going can sometimes start to hurt and unwind right. the good. Right. Is that correct? That's very true. Mm. I mean, for me, like, uh, my, my attention span, I got to go, I got to get another record in soon. Like, I, like, if I really love the song, I'll love spending two or three days on it, but I got to get to the next thing, you know what yeah. I mean? So, like, I won't get sick, so I still always love the song. I want to get to the next one, so okay. So, with, 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 what, with what we've got available to us now, we can always come back. Like, mm-hmm. like back during the analog days, um, like, I hate using that word. Um, it was all or nothing. If you had to do a right. recall, that was five grand for a recall. Oh, yeah. That would just be to change one word. Yeah. And uh, so, I know it's an impossible question to to, uh, to answer, but let's say a, a song like Closer that everybody knows. Had you started and done one thing a little different early on, would the mix have, have, have changed significantly? Like with me, I know like, like every decision causes, every, every decision I make in the process determines my next decision. And if I happen to make a bad decision early on, it's right. down with all the faders. And we say start over, but we don't really start over. But is that, does that happen to you sometime? And is there, have you noticed a pattern of things that, that tend to be the starting point to where you, they go bad? Like for me, it's, it's when I bring the vocals in, I realize I've screwed up something. Well, early on, I had a lot of that where I'd be like, man, I've been working on this thing for five or six hours. It's not sounding how I want it to sound. Strike it down and start something over. Mm-hmm. But because of the world we live in now, where what I was talking about earlier, and like I always said, it's the reference in the rough is key. Um, it kind of puts me in a situation where I kind of got to stay in a, in a certain ballpark. Mm-hmm. Now, it may take me a minute to get to where I wanted to go in that ballpark, but it, I don't really have a lot of times where I'm striking stuff down. I'm just kind of just maybe taking a little longer than what maybe another song would take me. Okay, I'm going to throw you a hypothetical. Let's say you don't have a rough <laughs> to kind of keep you on that mm-hmm. path. Um, and let's say, what kind of signals are you making? Talk to the thing. Just go ahead. Uh, 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 so, so, so you, 
you, you don't have a rough and, right. and you've started down that path, you, you've got the vocals pretty close, you've got the, mm -hmm. the kick and bass pretty close, and then let's say your decision that you make on the next important instrument mm -hmm. just doesn't turn out to work. Mm -hmm. at, at some point, is it just a simple matter of correcting that one instrument and the, everything's fixed, or, do you have, or does that decision have to make you go back and change things within? Mm -hmm. Sometimes what I might do is just take that thing out for a minute and not even mess with it at all and just try to make everything else in the mix better uh -huh. and then introduce it later and then maybe I'll have a better idea of what I want it to do later uh -huh. um, or just spend a little bit more time on it and just figure out where it needs to be, where it feels good. You know, a lot of times I just kind of mix off a of feel and mix as a fan of music as opposed to an engineer and what would somebody who want to listen to this record want to hear. You know, what's the most mm -hmm. important thing they, as the fan or, or the listener to music wants to hear that doesn't know anything about what I'm doing right now. Gotcha. And when you're, when you when you, when you, when the decision, that, when you start really going to that final part where you're, where you're, where you're, where you're working and you're focusing on just levels, you're trying to get everything sounding pretty good and you get your levels in. At that point in time, if you, if, if, if you change the EQ on the vocal and you add a little more 1K, the levels are wrong now because one can of vocal is like turning the fader right, up. Right. So, so, but, but by that time you're close enough to where it's just little tweaks. Yeah. And at what point, at what point do you put something on your stereo bus? In other words, do you, do you, are you constantly mixing into a compressor or are you putting that on at what point? The um, stereo bus compressor. On my chain, um, on the stereo bus compressor on the console, I'm using the NTI EQ. I'm sure you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to find. I love, love I love that thing, man. Um, I'm, I'm probably mixing with that on from John. Helped you get one, didn't I? Yeah, I think oh, so. Oh, good. I have a blue one, yeah. 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 Um, I can't get. It. I want another one. I can't find those. It's hard to find. But uh, I'm pretty much mixing with that with a kind of set EQ that I like mm -hmm. on all the time. Just kind of mixing through that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm coming back into Pro Tools, and I got a couple things that I use, a couple plugins that I'm using on the stereo bus in, that I'm mixing on, on Pro Tools on. Mm -hmm. And as as I get kind of oh, close, oh, oh, oh. you you you're, you're, you got a stereo bus. Like let's say if you let's say if you're working hybrid mm -hmm. using the that's, console that's as, a, really right. as a as uh, a as a sub mixer, mm -hmm. you you got something on that stereo bus, and then you got something in Pro Tools too yeah. coming back in. Coming back in. That's pretty cool. Uh, in batter's box, save 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 what uh, you use on okay. those because I'm gonna have to. I want to find All out. Right. That's pretty neat. Okay, so so I zone because that that you, you threw me off. So mm -hmm. so you so you put that on at what point in time? Well, uh, the NTI EQ is probably always on, so I'm already starting mixing through that. And you um, have a, a preset you start with. A preset I start with, yeah. Cool. Um, and then as I'm coming back into Pro Tools, like I said, I got a few things on a, on the incoming bus, and those are probably pretty much set at zero. Mm -hmm. And as I develop it with the mix and kind of get it closer, then I start thinking about what I want to do with another little EQ that I have, I use on there, or maybe another, you know, maximizer just to kind of for monitoring purposes to see what it feels like pumped up to break the mix, mm -hmm. you know, later on. Um, and I've been making a little adjustments as I'm mixing, doing touching the vocals. And if you're in my mix session, just see me moving around a lot, and I'll come over and mess with the kick, and then I'll come over and mess with maybe guitar, and I'm tweaking that. I'm just going mm -hmm. off a of feel, just kind of, okay, this vocal doesn't sound right enough versus that hi-hat, let me turn that down, let me, I'm just kind of, look like man, I'm scatterbrained, but got, I'm actually... You got me screwed up here, man. <laughs> um, let me explain something to the audience. You never ask an engineer personal questions like Polaroids of his wife or his girlfriend, and you never ask them about particular favorite settings in this. Now you can ask me because I don't care, but you just never do that. So don't don't ask me. I'm not going to ask him how he, his preset for when he starts off. But I'm curious about this preset thing. I've never done that, but it makes so much sense, doesn't it? I never thought about starting like like most most of the time. I tend to do the same things anyway. Mm -hmm. So why not start there? Mm -hmm. Is that what you is is that the process with, with, with which you started doing that? Yeah. Start start somewhere where I know that feels good That's and then genius. take it to the next thing or, or you know take it this way take it left take it right but start at a point where you, yeah, I'm familiar. Uh, do other people do that? I'm sure yeah I think I, don't I, I think I just kind of stole a little bit of that from Dexter Simmons a little bit of that from Manny uh, and Dexter. Day Way I stole a lot of that little <laughs> little tricks man. Dexter's a buddy I didn't know yeah. he did that Dexter does that? I mean I learned that vocal first thing from, from him. Oh yeah back, I learned that from him too. Yeah. yeah Dexter always yeah. started with the vocals. Yeah. 
I think John Marie starts with the vocals too, didn't he? Say, you remember her? I don't remember. I think John Marie said he starts with the vocals too. But man, starting with the EQ already on, that's pretty neat. Okay, so what about compression on uh, on the stereo bus? Like, do you do you do you do the same thing where where it's always set to a um, no, a starting point and I'm, then and I'm then you really kind of starting with the compression off because you okay. just never know what kind of song it is if it's a real percussive song you don't want to just start with one set it's not going to work for every song mm -hmm. um, as the song is going along maybe then I'll adjust with the SSL compressor on the console um, that's pretty much the only compressor I'm using on the mix um, maybe using a maximizer like I said for monitoring purposes just to hear it pumped up but like to emulate yeah, ma yeah, to a emulate, mastering exactly um, but for the most part, I'm just kind of adjusting it as the song goes. And as levels change, sometimes I'll change the levels of, of the blend. The blend might be too hot, and I might bring the blend down, and that changes the compression, you know, ratio, compression to threshold. You, would, you so. would change, you pull all the, what you're sending the compressor down instead of changing the threshold? Right, because sometimes the, my, my, my blend might be too hot or it might be too low, I'm, or I might be like, I, I mean, hate it when that happens. But that's the thing about working on a J, you can just kind of, yeah. Tap it down, and it's yeah. where it needs to be. And um, the the our audience knows I'm fascinated by compression. I'm not quite sure why, but so I might ask some stupid compression questions. But so, at what point in the mix are, is the compression pretty much ninety percent set where it's going to be set? When you at the point where you get the drums done. Um, for compression is pretty much, I'd say, 80 to 90 percent set once I kind of start tuning with the sound itself. Like, I might do some slight compression on the vocal mm -hmm. and then kind of set that there, let that be, and maybe come back later, just tweaking it ever so slightly during the course of the mix. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll pull up a kick and I like the way the kick sounds with that co compressor on it and feels good and, my, and I think the compression is right and then it'll probably stay, but I might adjust that EQ later or tweak the level of it. Gotcha. Um, but for the most part, the compression is pretty much set when I first hear the sound with some slight tweaks later. And, and on the stereo bus, what are you listing for when, you, when you're setting the compressor? Are you, are, you, are you listing to get the maximum volume possible? So in other words, you're taking the peaks and kind of tucking them back in. And what does that sound like to you when it sounds right? Can you describe the sound of when the compressor sounds right? Oh, when the compressor sounds right to me, it sounds like a, a, a complete mix. It feels like I'm hearing everything that I want to hear, the stuff in the back, the stuff in the front. Um, it, it just kind of makes it feel like it's a complete record to me. It, that's the best way I can explain it. Um, like a lot of people use the term glue. It feels like the mix is a great glued term, together. Yeah. Is that, yeah. that kind of what you're That's, saying? Exactly. And when does that happen in the process? Um, Six o'clock, eight o'clock? Eight, nine o'clock. Oh, know? that late? Yeah, yeah. Just kind of just feeling where maybe from the time of six o'clock on, it just started to feel, starting to come together and where it needs to be. And, and uh, we'll save this for batter's box, but do you tend to always use the same Stereo bus compressor? Uh, yeah, pretty much for the most part. Okay, and that's because you're very familiar with mm -hmm. it. It, right. it delivers what you always exactly. want. Pretty cool. Speaking of, uh -huh. your arm warmed up? Yeah. It's batter's box time. No. Yeah, it is. And we just started this 10 minutes ago. It goes fast, man. We've got great guests. You, you, know, you know your income is tied yeah. to my mix success. I mean, he's giving me good information. I can't, I mean, I think this well, is going to increase my income. Well, the good news is that you believe it's tied <laughs> That's part of my job. Let's tee him up. I forgot. No, I can't say that. Uh, a young lady will kill me if I say that. Ooh, I made myself laugh. Batter's box. You didn't ask any questions, Herb. I know, because they've already rolled the uh, graphic and we're waiting on you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's Pensado's place. I can do what I want. Yeah. yeah. Everybody can leave. There laughed. <laughs> that, that was the audience leaving. <laughs> Everybody laughed but her. I'm in trouble. Okay, ready? Yes. Okay, lead vocals. Lead vocals. Avalon 2055. Avalon 2055. Wow. I love that. Background vocals. Summit DCL 200. I hate those. Really? Acoustic guitar. Uh, whew. We don't get a lot of those. Uh, I, I we had one on closer. I'll get some from time to time. Uh, what do I like on those? What EQ do you like? API 560. 
Oh, wow. Graphic. Good. Rap lead vocals. Uh, TLA 100 Summit. Wow. Uh, electric piano. Electric piano. Uh, sometimes nothing if it sounds good. I don't know. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Synth strings. Uh, if it sounds fine, sometimes it's SSL EQ and call it a day. Cool. Synth bass. Synth bass. Oh, wait a minute, I know the answer to this. You better not lie to me. What? Distressor. Moogie Q. Distressor. Moogie Q. 560, <laughs> whatever. Okay. Uh, like synth pads and stuff. You still use the Moogie Q, right? Uh, from time to time, yeah. Um, if I can find a clean sounding one. It's well, I hard. tell you, I They're got hard. two that aren't yeah. working now. Yeah. Uh, synth pads. Synth pads, kind of like let them be how they are. Maybe some light, slight EQ, board EQ. Okay. I got a question for the later on those. Electric guitar. Electric guitar. Uh, distressor. Uh, 1176, I don't know. Okay. Um, kicks, like sample kicks. Kicks, 33609. Uh, really? 5, 550A. Uh, what else? Distressor sometimes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, snares. Sample 33609, same thing. Have you always been using 33609 on yeah, that? Like, like my three, favorite drum yeah, sound, like was three, that a 33609? Three, three of them, yeah. Come you never told me that. I've been doing it wrong all these years. I don't know if I used it back years. then, but, Oh, okay, yeah. good. I was starting to feel kind of hurt here. Um, when you have live drums, what do you, what do you like on your overheads? Overheads, uh, depends on you know what they sound like. Um, I use them maybe sometimes in manly. Uh, variable mu. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, sometimes nothing. It just depends on how it sounds. And then stereo bus. Stereo bus. <laughs> Give me your compressor. Uh, compressor is the SSL. Um, <coughs> come off the board, mm -hmm. NTI EQ. And your favorite plugin? There's three of them I kind of use. It's kind of crazy. You might not like it, people like it, whatever. Tell um, me, tell me. Isotope ozone. Oh, yeah, that thing's great. Um, I like. Uh, I put the L3 on there just to kind of give it a little pump, um, and I use sometimes I use uh, what do I use? I keep multimedia stuff, the um, cheat racks. Oh, uh, I love that! Like uh, uh, Dave stuff. Kutcher was on the show, right. and he he said he uses that for mastering. Yes. Yeah, How do cool. you do, Herm? Mm -hmm. How do you do? He did great. He did great. You know, How did it feel? It was good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any more? Yeah, I've always got more. Shoot a couple more. So the 33609. I like. like it. Like, how do you use that on on a kit? I mean, what, like, do you use a slow attack, a fast attack? A fast attack sometimes uh, depends on the it depends on the sound, but most of the time on fast attack, it's kind of some sort of slight, nothing too crazy, just to kind of give it. Do you it, parallel it, or do you just put it on the on the sound itself? Put, put it on the sound on the on the, on the insert sound on itself. Um, I may put an EQ after it, um, and I'm also using the board EQ as well, and just kind of tightening it up and then making it bang EQ wise. Wow. And, and, and just for our audience, the difference between a, the sound of a fast attack and a slow attack on the kick drum is what? For me, it's just the reaction of the compressor, how, how it's going to choke it down. Like, it's going to choke it down fast, going to choke it down slow. By choke, you mean like the attack? The attack of it, so of it like, yeah. So exactly. like a faster attack would give you... Just more of a smackier sound. I gotcha. You know, especially uh -huh. on kicks and drums that are aggressive sound, you want them to smack harder, I'd use a fast attack. And like, what kind of ratio do you like? Uh, in general, you know, four to one, six to one, on standard then, yeah, stuff. Yeah. And you set the release time based on the sample itself. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. Some slow. I mean, or something, or something fast, like a hundred, something like that. And, and uh, when 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 you're when you're working and and it's ten o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And you're noticing that the compressor is like moving, like maybe two dB, two dB. But every time your snare drum hits, the compressor knocks off. 6 dB. Mm -hmm. Do you slow the attack time on the compressor or do you go to the snare and kind of take some of the low end out of it? Whatever's causing that compressor to move too much, is that's going to affect the overall volume level of your right. mix. Well, first I'll listen to it and see what it's doing, just kind of see if it's making a big difference. And if it is, if the compressor is moving too much, I might just back off the threshold of the compressor and just let it breathe, let it be what it is. Oh, okay. um, I might go mess with the snare, mess with the low end, mess with, with the compressor, but I'm listening to how it feels overall before I look at my eyes and say, oh, the compressor's moving too much, I gotta do something, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, but, but is that something you do? You, like, I do that, cause, but I'm not real good with compression, but um, 
I'm sure you're pretty good with compression. <laughs> so uh, you're okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am good with it, but sometimes I feel like people know more about it than I do. I don't know why. Like you talk Brower and Jack Joseph Puig and Manny and those guys. I mean, I'm not the greatest with compression. I just do it till it feels good. That's and, you know, all I do. That's, that's the best thing I could tell anybody. Just if it feels good, you know, it works. Roll with and, it. And you and I, you and I have very similar ways. We came up pretty much. We we. We, we were blessed that we could talk to some of the greats and mm -hmm. kind of see how they did things, but if you talk to a NASCAR driver and he explains to you how to go around a track 200 miles an hour, at some point you got to get a car, get in a car and start driving. Exactly. It doesn't really do you right. a whole lot of good. And uh, sometimes I worry about our audience that, that they expect to get really good really fast after one Kevin Davis episode. They expect to be at your level, but there's no substitute for just doing it and if you yeah. love it you don't realize you did it for 20 years like dude we've been doing this been when doing i met while, you right? you were a teenager yeah i mean i've been doing it for a while and it took me a what minute to kind of get to where i wanted to go as far as becoming a decent mix engineer and um mm -hmm. you know it just would you say this is an accurate statement because you and i have very similar like like in the sense that that we both respect the musicality and, and the musicianship that's in a mix and we try to make our mixes for lack of a better term, musical, because mm -hmm. that's our background. You grew right. up around music, I grew up around music. Um, back before I got a lot of skills, it was my musicality that, that got me through mm -hmm. with lack of skill because people liked my mixes because they just felt good and, and mm -hmm. had great vibes and stuff. And then as I got my skill level, I was able to, to, to control that more. But there's just no substitute for just listening to tons of music, being a huge fan, and then you wake up 10 years later and you're good. Mm -hmm. It's not that you try to be good, it's you couldn't help it because we just did it so much. You worked every day at something right. in the music world. I mean, uh, you and I were always in the same studio together and you were always working. And there's just, you know, like the guys that, that are at home, they got to work a day job till five in the afternoon and then they come home and work. It's, if you want to get good, you just got to put the time in, you know, and if you love it, it you just do it, and you just wake up one day, and you're not not too bad, right? That's definitely what it is. Yes. So we got a bunch of people in our chat room. Can we take some questions from sure, them to yes. ask you? Definitely, okay, definitely. Drew, you want to fire away? <laughs> yeah, for it's sure. It's office time. We got a question from JJ Boogie Retchart. Uh, what roles Reichert. does what is it? Reichert from Atlanta. Yeah. So what, yeah. Retchart. Either way. <laughs> Sorry, JJ. <laughs> uh, what role does parallel compression play in our in your mixing? Uh, use it on just drums or various instruments, including vocals? Various instruments. Uh, I'll put them on guitars, I'll put them on uh, background, I'll put it on whatever whatever needs be. But a lot, a lot of times, too, it's the, the compression that you don't use that makes it sound good. Like, if you don't use anything, it might sound best with nothing on it. That's true. Dave, you Especially got, nowadays, yeah. compression. What's play. your input, Dave? I'm curious on that myself. Read, read the question again real it's, quick. Uh, what role does parallel compression play in your mixing? Is it just on drums or various instruments, including vocals? Uh, well, I mean, you, you, you guys have been watching the show. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of parallel compression. I, I use it on vocals I, to bring out the bottom end, the roundness in the bottom of the vocal. I use it on kicks and snares because it allows me to get more volume without moving that stereo bus meter we were talking about on the compressor. Uh, I like it on bass a lot. I use it on those four things quite a bit, kick, snare, bass, vocals. And her view? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> oh, I was going to answer you, but it's okay. I'll keep my mix secret secret. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ghost mixer. Exactly. Uh, okay. Parallel compression works in your daily life. Yeah. Figure that metaphor out. Let me know what you think. <laughs> All right, for another one from Mike Walls. Uh, Kevin, how do you go about creating or defining a sense of space for synthesized instruments that is believable when mere reverb doesn't cut it? Ooh, that's a course. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Um, again, like I really reference the record as it feels, so I don't ever know if I'm getting that technical with it, like the space of this where it sits. I don't know. I just mix by feel. If it feels right, it feels right. Um, every song's different. Some songs are similar, but I just kind of get into the where I, a space I think it needs to go, mm -hmm. just based on feel. Yeah, Not guys, even scientific. guys Kev, uh, Kevin brings up a, a good point. A lot of the things we talk about on the show, we don't think about creating space. We just think about making it sound a particular way. So um, Kevin's a master at it, but we just we just don't tend to sometimes 
categorize the process to getting it. Uh, it's a combination of EQ, panning, uh, plugins that give you spatial, the, the, the ratio of different frequencies to different frequencies. Like you don't have to pan the whole thing one side, you can just pan the low frequency to one side or just pan the high end to one side and create spaces. But you don't think about that, you just think about does it feel and sound good or does it not, you know? Cool. Thanks, got, Mike. Good question. Got another one from uh, Brad Binge. Uh, do you ever intentionally mix the beginning of a song or certain sections of a song at quieter overall levels to allow the chorus hook uh, to increase in actual volume? Or would you consider that more the job of the mastering engineer? I don't, that wouldn't have anything to do with it. I make, depending on the record, I'll mix it, you know, at, at build up on the choruses or bigger parts of the song. I'll definitely do that. Some songs are just at level 10 from bar one to bar one to end, you know, it just, it just depends on the record and how it is. Cool, cool. Um, another one from Will Young. Is it better to hard pan electric guitars left and right when there are four or more different rhythm tracks? What is a good technique to even out and widen those tracks? Uh, depends on the song for me. Like I always say it depends on the record, but sometimes I'll have them panned in, sometimes I'll have them panned hard left and right. Um, maybe some course and on there, I don't know. Just I just try different things, maybe some delays to make it feel bigger, um, or it just really depends. It's your, at your discretion for the most part. Can I, can I take a shot at that, Will? Of course. I mean, Will. Will was the question. Her, uh, um, panning is something that, that I think you guys at home overthink about. Um, some of the greatest records ever made were made in mono. So panning is, look at it as, is, sometimes it's a tool, sometimes it's an effect, sometimes it's a, a, a technique, but everything doesn't have to be stereo. And I think what Kevin does and what other greats do is, is they don't pan everything hard left and right. They're, they're very comfortable having a sound be mono on one side and another sound be mono on the other side. They go for balance, they go for for proportion, just enough milk, just enough cornflakes. That's what you want. And so don't always, what'll get you started on answering your own question is experiment first with, with mono. And, 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 and remember, there's three sacred spots in the mix, left, right, and middle. And you've got to ask yourself every second of the process, is this important enough to go in the middle? Or is this important enough to go on both sides? Because sometimes, the, the vocals are, are, are so important, you want to give them space on the edges and you want to give them complete dominance in the middle. So think of panning as, as, as not where to put stuff, but also think of it as where not to put stuff. And that'll help you answer your own question. Cool. Two more, Drew. Two more, okay. We got uh, one from David Arthur Van Norden. Kevin, what are some techniques that you use to make a dull vocal, uh, vocal performance more exciting? Uh, I mentioned before, I like using that Avalon 2055. It's got a really nice top end sound on it. Uh, doing rides in the verse, just kind of in certain words in certain places to make it feel like it's popping out. Yeah. Um, I'm also using a combination of the EQ on the board. Just kind of making it just the vocal feel alive, but a lot, a lot of it's in the EQ and a lot of it's in the placement of the track and the blend. The 2055 is unparalleled in mm -hmm. terms of sound, but is there is there a plug-in that comes close to emulating it? Man, I'll tell you the truth, um, plug-in-wise, I really haven't found a plug-in that does what I like the other 2055 does. Can you describe um, what you like? It gets, it gets the brightness without getting It's got a bright air to it without being harsh, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a smooth overall EQ. Um, the mid-range sounds great on it. It's a real musical sounding EQ. Um, it is. And I thought that was one of the greatest EQs invented, and I still use it to this day. I agree. Cool, cool. All right, last one. Thanks, Dave. Um, By the way, Dave's got the award for the greatest name of the show right? today. David Arthur Van name. Norden. Uh, one more from uh, Alex Bays. Bays, whatever. When you hit the... <laughs> Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Our guests are going to start spelling their names phonetically for Drew. All right. When you hit the clip indicators on plugins, for both of you guys, when you hit the clip indicator on plugins, is that a no-no, or is it up to your ears? For me, it's up to your ears. I try to stay away from the clip because um, it can sound distorted later, but um, it's really up to your ears. If that's the kind of sound you're going for, then then great. Uh, I, I'll take a shot at that. Who's quick? Oh, that's Alex. Alex. Yeah. Um, 
in the analog world, uh, the redder the better. Um, in the digital world, I've been burned a few times. Late at night, my hearing's not quite as good at four in the morning, and I, I ignore a clip light, and a few times it's come back and bit me in the ass. I've had to redo the mix. So in the digital world, zero, zero, you, don't, you can't get past zero. There's just, now in the analog world, zero is just a road sign you go past 200 miles an hour. But in the digital world, you, you, you I used to think people were, were pussies when they just had zero on the analog world. But in the digital world, I, I, I ruined a few mixes that I had to do over because try to stay actually, try to stay two to three dB under, under clip and under zero and, and your mixes will be wider and you'll, you'll have room for things to, peaks to kind of, like transients to kind of dip above the, you know like the sunspots look on the surface of the moon? Think of sounds that kind of get above the surface. If, if you're at zero, they have no place to go, those little extra sounds. But if you stay three dB below zero, they have a place to go. And that's the lesson I just learned a couple of years ago. In the digital world, none of the analog rules apply. And if you apply them, you're going to start bitching about digital doesn't sound good. So it's, it's a whole different process. There's almost nothing that applies to both worlds. And, and, and so don't ignore those clip lights. Uh, you've gotten burned, too, I'm sure. We all have. Yeah, and you think it sounds good, and then you wake up fresh the next morning, and ring, ring, mm -hmm. ring, ring, and you know it's that call. Mm -hmm. KD? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Goes fast, huh? Yes, yes. It's yeah. Very Pleasure, fun. man. Thank you. I always enjoy I learned that. so much, man. I tell you what. A lot of requests I, I, for I, you. I think my mixes are going to be, I say this often enough on the show, and people don't think I'm telling the truth, but I learned some stuff today that I know is going to make me a better mixer. It's, uh, I, I wish... I wish we could get all of us that do this in a room one day and just start trading things, you know, because we're so, the old, the old model, Herb, was, he goes into his cave, I go into my cave. I never, I, when I go visit him, I never turn around and look at his gear. That's considered rude. Mm -hmm. I try to actually stay behind the gear so I'm I not being his, thought of. I always look at his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I take it back to the room. You're, you're, you're I'm like younger. Yeah. But you know what I'm talking about. Like yeah, you go into somebody else's room and you stay behind the gear because you don't want to think you're stealing something, you know. I mean, you and I are friends. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, of course, I'd tell you anything if you wanted it. You just right. never want it. But um, <laughs> Will you come back? Definitely. We'd love this to have fun, you back. I like, yeah, yeah, good, good. And the information is valuable, our audience. Yeah, so we learn so much. We have a lot of requests for you. Because so a lot of guys, yeah. we, we, we got them up to how to EQ a kick drum somewhere around March or April of last year. Yeah. Then we got them into where, uh, what to do with vocals. And now, today, for the first time, you've been told how to assemble all these ideas. It's like cooking spaghetti sauce. We taught you how to chop the garlic, how to boil the noodles. Now it's putting it all in the pot and how to cook it day with uh, Kevin Davis. And Kevin, man, I, I, I can't thank you enough. I learned thank a lot you, and I appreciate you coming by. We, we really had a lot of fun. Good fun. Yeah. And we'll have more next week. Yay. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> all right. Not much to wrap up. I'm, I'm, I'm assimilating so much information. Um, I don't have anything clever or witty today, Herb, so just, just a goodbye, huh? Just invite him back next week and say goodbye. Okay, guys. As always, thanks so much for dropping by, and um, keep those cards and letters coming, and we'll see you next week.